get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like uh, the founders of RX Bars, and they end up selling a Kellogg for $600 million, but we talked about early on how they built it from scratch and bootstrapped it, and P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime. Like, that's actually how he made food and rent money, Richard. He would put his hat onto the street and do street miming, and that's how he made his his rent, and... um, before he obviously sold hundreds of millions of dollars in P90X. Uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about how when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. That's a, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big miss. Um, so this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And what we do is create a systemized incoming referral pipeline, which generates ROI using a podcast. And for me, um, podcasting is one of the best things I've done for my business and my life, but it's much more personal um, because it's not just about your business. In my mind, it's about leaving a legacy for yourself and your guests. And it was inspired, and Richard, you relate to this, um, by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, were the only members of their family to survive. And his words and legacy live on because of the interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him, which you can watch on my About page. And it's really inspired me, and I watch it at least twice a year um, to, to hear about it. And that wouldn't be possible if they didn't do the interview. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy. And you can check it out. Check us out at rise25.com if you have questions. Um, you, know, you can email us support at rise25media.com where we handle 99% of all the work behind the scenes and the strategy. So I am super excited uh, about today's guest, Richard Rossi. Um, he's co founder of two of the world's largest and most prestigious enrichment programs for high achieving students uh, Da Vinci Education, davinci.com. In 1986, he co-founded Envision EMI, which grew into the country's largest provider of live leadership and career exploration programs for high-achieving students. They had 50,000 students a year attended, in attendance with over 200 staff and annual revenues exceeding $120 million, and they sold Envision EMI in 2011. He didn't go and sit on a beach what he did was he went and started another business. And in 2013, he started a business that now fills stadiums with parents and students. And if you want to think about it and visualize it, think of, visualize a stadium with tens of thousands of people. Think TED Talk meets Tony Robbins meets rock concert. And they put the biggest names in the world on the stage in the STEM fields. I'm hoping to take my daughters to this and when they're old enough. And they create a magical experience where high achievers, kid, high achieving kids come and they find their tribe. You know, the people that they've been looking for, you know, you know people who are high achievers are, you know, a little bit different you know, um, and they find in a positive way and they find the other people exactly like them. So in the past few decades, more than 640,000 students from more than uh, 118 countries collectively have attended these academic programs. You know, it's, Richard, it's amazing the impact that you've had and your companies have had. And um, also, if that wasn't enough, he's also created the highest level mastermind in the world for biohacking maximum health and radical life extension. He's assembled a rock star group of advisors and faculty at the da Vinci 50.com. That's five zero.com. And some of the people he's assembled are amazing. Like George church, professor of genetics at Harvard, Bill Falloon. He's a leading researcher for life extension, longevity, Dave Asprey, Dr. Mercola, Rhonda Patrick, and so many more. Richard, I mean, you, you deserve that, intro and I wanted to say every last word of it. So thank you for joining me. Oh, so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. 
Um, I wanted to start with, with the journey. Um, and, you know, we will find out. I just want to tease a little bit because I personally want to know what you do, what you've done as far as your health and longevity and what you've seen in the research. So we will dive into those and what you've done personally and what you recommend. Um, but I want to start off with the journey and it kind of starts with your parents. They were immigrants. They escaped World War II. And having you talk about your mom's journey and influence a little bit. Well, it was uh, extremely profound. They both were uh, Jews escaping Hitler and uh, my mom from Austria, my dad from Italy. They immigrated to the U.S. in the um, in the 1940s, got married, had me 13 years later. They separated when I was in the third grade and um, I lived in the, one of the richest towns in America, and I was one of the poorest kids in that town. We really had almost nothing, but I had a mom who loved me and was 100% committed to me, maybe 200% committed to me, and made sure that even though she had little to nothing, I had everything. I got to go on skiing trips, and I got to mm. go do sailing lessons, and I got to feel just like a regular kid in, mm. uh, in the school system there in Greenwich, Connecticut. But it taught me a lot about sacrifice. Um, I, I really was, in every sense of the word, uh, the, the sole focus of her life. Mm. What did she do? Well, she really was just, she, she was a mom. Uh, mm -hmm. But before uh, that, she was a, an artist, a graphic artist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when she came to the U.S. and got married, the, she really became just, um, just a great mom. And I hate to say the word mom, because just mom, because every mother is a working mother. Um, and it's, it's like uh, the hardest job. I mean, well, the multitasking involved is insane. <laughs> so. and, and, and it is uh, it is an incredibly noble profession so um she really we, we relied on the little money that we got from my dad every month and uh we just soldiered through and then uh went together to washington dc when it was time for college yeah what were some of the things that you learned from her um because i know that she's a big you know inspiration to you well, you know, I learned positive and negative things. Um, on, on the positive side, um, I, I learned about the power of love uh, mm -hmm. and commitment. And there was no question. It was total. It was absolute. There was incredible sacrifice every day. Uh, there were so many things that she could have done with the paucity of money that we had. But instead, she decided it was all going to go to me. I was it. I was her hope. I was her inspiration. I was her focus. Um, and that was amazing. I also learned later in life when I reflected upon it about the, the, the power of um, survival because her parents died, her sister died, her aunt died. Uh, she was devastated. She never recovered. And mm. as I thought about it later in life, I realized she probably never went through a day without suffering. She didn't really make that super obvious to me, but um, death and suffering were always in the picture with her. And I think in a lot of ways, she just kind of white knuckled her way through uh, mm. life. This is, there's some people that because of their psychological makeup, they can get over it and they can live a great life. And there's some people that just can't get over it. And she just was one of those people that was knocked to the ground and couldn't totally get up afterwards. But mm. she certainly did everything to be a great mom. Yeah, it seemed like she put on a strong um, facade for you. Um, no matter what, right? No doubt. And, yeah. and on the negative side is also, I think, the, the, it was kind of the same thing, which was I was the total focus. I was uh, the person that she was thinking about working with and, and um, in a sense, uh, directing every day. And that was suffocating. Right. So, and, 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 and what I learned as a kid was how do I work around that? How can I be a normal kid, have my friends, go out, have a drink every once in a while, do some things that are naughty um, without disappointing her? So, mm. I, I a lot of pressure. Learned, yeah, enormous, enormous pressure. And it wasn't even hidden. It was like, okay, Richard, I'm alive because of, for you, it's the only reason I'm alive. I'm like, oh, great. So, but no pressure it, there. What I, yeah, right, Jewish mom. But what I learned was, um, <laughs> how to kind of just get around that. And with my own kids, uh, it taught me a lot about, uh, you know, when to hold, when to fold, when to push, when to hold back, um, and how much to get involved and how much to allow mm -hmm. them to make their own decisions and mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's one story that sticks out to me that you have told about 
your mom's um, candlestick holders, which I think well, kind of demonstrate this whole, what exactly what you're saying. Yeah, there's really nothing that demonstrates it as well as that. So as I mentioned, we were super poor, super, super, super poor. And one of the things that I wanted to do is play in the school band. I wanted to play the flute. Um, but that was there was no money for a flute, period. So she took the only thing that she had left from her parents, which was a set of silver candlesticks, took the train into New York City, went to a pawn shop and pawned them so that we could have enough money to rent not to buy, but to rent a flute. Yes. And every month she would take the train in New York to pay the interest so that they wouldn't sell those candlesticks. And I got to play the flute. I was mm. never very good, but I got to play it. And it was just another thing that I wanted to do to be a real regular kid. And she made every sacrifice to make it happen. And she eventually recovered those, those candlesticks mm. and, and they're down in my living room, or mm. my dining room right now. Mm. But that's a real microcosm of my mother for sure. That's but amazing. It was a, in a lot of ways, she lived a very tragic life because, um, when when something like World War II hits, when you lose your entire family, um, there are consequences, and and they they were with her the rest of her life. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. Right? At uh, how old was she when she came over? She was to, in her early twenties. Yeah, twenties, just uprooting, leaving your whole family, and leaving them behind, and then never seeing them again. You know, it's just. Well, there's also survivor's guilt, right? So she tried to get them to come with her, and they wouldn't. They, it was the classic thing. If you read about World War II, people stayed behind because they thought it wasn't going to get worse, and they mm. had no idea how much worse it actually was going to get. By the time they realized it, they couldn't get out. Yeah, I think, you know, Richard, one of the, I mean, inspirations for your eventual business, um, helping the high-achieving students, was from your mom, right? Oh, absolutely. No question about it, because she, well... Look, she died when I was 24 years old and only a few miles from here. And I was sitting by her bedside when she died. And before she died, we had a, a conversation where I said, tell me what you want from me. You have sacrificed everything. What do you want? Uh, and she said, well, I want you to help people. And I thought, oh, this is going to be that hard. And you know, I could be a doctor. I could be a social worker or whatever. And she said, no, 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 no. I want you to help people. And at that moment, I realized she was actually referring to humanity. And I remember so clearly, Jeremy, thinking at that moment, uh, well, that's never going to happen. And yet, uh, as time has gone on, I really feel like I have uh, had an impact and that she would be proud of me. That is amazing. And you have continued to. Um, Liz, I want to give people the just a quick timeline over your jobs and careers because it's pretty uh diverse um to start and you know i know in, in college um you know after college what you did but i know you know you didn't have a typical college experience where you know you had to put your way through georgetown and so you would you know you had to work your way through and at night and so you know over that that time period right well i came to dc uh, I, I enrolled in Georgetown University. At that time, we were still getting money from my dad, both for tuition and for child support. And um, I volunteered up on in the United States Senate for my senator. And it's interesting because back then, in the early 70s, if you looked at um, like who were the most respected institutions, the, the first were firefighters and the second was Congress. And if you look at it now, the first is firefighters and Congress is actually at the absolute bottom. <laughs> Uh, but back then they were held in high regard and I volunteered for my senator. And then a year later, the checks started, stopped coming in and my dad moved to France and my mom had no sellable skills. So here I was, we were destitute. I mean, as in literally, we, it, would, it was nothing, not even to buy a sandwich. So I went up to my senator, Senator Weicker, and I said, sir, I need a job. And God bless him. Um, he said, I'll give you a job. And, uh, and he did. And I worked in the Senate for nine years after that and uh, took eight years to, to work my way through Georgetown at night and also support my mom, who died four years into that. Hmm. Do you think that this has driven you? Like, do you run from that? You know, like, just like, has driven you so much to be, make a difference, to be successful, you know? Well, 
Yes and no. I, I mean, I'm, I, I, when I reflect back on it, a lot of what happened to me was taking advantage of opportunities that were presented to me, for better mm-hmm. or worse. And um, uh, no successful person, if they're being honest, will discount the role that luck plays and being in the right place at the right time. And I took advantage of that when it presented itself and mm-hmm. then tried to maximize the opportunity. But honestly, it was only decades later that I reflected back on the conversation I had with my mom and I connected mm, the yeah. fact that she had asked that of me to the fact that I thought, wow, maybe I've actually achieved that. It was pretty monumental because it wasn't in my conscious mind. Yeah, it was in the subconscious. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Your entrepreneur journey started with a software business. It did. And in fact, I never thought of it as entrepreneurship. I didn't know what that word meant. It seemed like a very highfalutin word to me. I was just uh, a single guy who was judgment proof (laughs) and uh, didn't have a possession in the world and came up with an idea of creating a computer system for political campaigns uh, to handle all their fundraising and their uh, their filings for the government and and thank you letters and all the rest. That really didn't exist at the time. You were ahead of your time, yeah. Yeah, everything was done out of a shoebox and three by five cards. And I just knew a guy who was a good friend of mine who was a programmer and I, there was a guy and worked in the office who was willing to fund us. And I was like, well, you know, let's just see what happens. And off we went uh, to start our first business. And so what happened? Oh oh my God, it was a miserable failure. And the reason is that uh, we were never able to produce a stable product and we were never really that great at marketing. And boy, did I, I mean, I tell you, you do this for a while and you get your MBA the hard way. You really do. You learn uh, what it means and how and what it takes to really succeed and survive through not succeeding and failing, right? Um, And so at 28 or 29, it was, it was, uh, it was my first journey into what I later learned was entrepreneurship. But I want to emphasize the fact that there was no big aha moment where I said, all right, I'm getting on this ship and I'm going to take this amazing journey into the entrepreneurial world. I was just this young kid going, what the heck? I've been doing this a long time. Let me try this. It just never occurred to me that it was any sort of big deal. Yeah. You saw like a pain point, a problem, and you just went out to solve it. Yeah, it was a big problem. It was yeah. just before the introduction of the PC. So we actually built it on a, uh, on a small mainframe computer, mm. a mini computer, they were called back then. You know, Richard, of the many things uh, how I try and describe you, one of the terms that I always describe you when I tell other people about you is he's a direct male genius. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you learn from political direct mail. And I want you to talk a little bit about the first mailing you did for the business. Well, after the education business. Yeah. yeah. So after my first company failed, I did some consulting uh, for the political parties in Washington, especially the Republicans, and a high dollar donor program called the Republican Senatorial Committee, $5,000 a year per person. And at that time, I learned from one of the masters of direct mail um, who worked for the Senatorial Committee what that even meant. And I got to work on this incredible package where we actually took a baronial, which is like an envelope used for a a mailing um, for a wedding and we actually engraved it and we actually calligraphied it Mm. and put heavy card in there and all the rest and invited people to join the senatorial committee. And it was a phenomenally successful package, what I today would call a shock and awe package. Mm -hmm. It just was one of those things you couldn't not open. We sent it certified mail. Um, It was just it was a it, it was a barn burner. I mean, you just looked at that thing, and there wasn't a chance in the world you were going to throw it away. <laughs> uh, and I learned a lot from that. I learned, and that has always been my specialty: has been the so-called shock and awe package. And then I learned about how to locate and mail to the right people. In the Republicans, uh, we had two great packages, one, two great list sources. One was called 
big buck hunters with big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the other was the other was this grapefruit company in Florida called Frank Lewis Grapefruits. And it just turned out that if you bought expensive grapefruits by direct mail from Florida, you were a Republican, period. End of How did you figure that out? Oh, I, I didn't, the, the, but the, the guys up in the, in the committee did. And the answer is they bought and tested hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Wow. Of and then Expensive they found ones Expensive grapefruits were. equals Republican? Absolutely. <laughs> Frank Lewis grapefruit. I don't know if they still exist, but they were great grapefruits, by the way. Um, so I want to hear about your first mailing. You spent $2,500. Right. But before you talk about that, What's the, your favorite lumpy mail, shock and awe, you've received and or sent out? So you talked about one of them. What, is there any that you've received personally or that you've sent out that stick out to you as cool shock and awe oh, lumpy yeah. mail packages? Oh, yeah. It's actually, I wish I had one right here. I have them downstairs, but it's one I'm doing right now, okay. which is the uh, video brochure. So basically, it is a, looks like a little uh, brochure book, which is a little book. And it can be several different sizes, but you open it and there's a video screen in there of good quality and a speaker and it just begins playing. Hmm. So think about it. You take this thing out of the envelope and it's thick and it you know, kind of demands to be inspected and you open it up and it just starts playing. And in this case, it's my face and it's my voice and it's good quality. And I'm talking directly to you. That, my friend, is pretty damn awesome. And they're individually recorded for each recipient or? Whatever you want. Okay. Whatever you want. In my case, uh, sometimes, I, depending on the value of the mailing, I'll do one that's personalized to you. Mm -hmm. uh, in other cases, it'll just be a mailing for mm. people like you. Hey, you know, Jeremy, you're a high achieving kid who wants to be a doctor. I know you're in high school right now, and I think there's something you need to know about. Oh, wow, that's me, mm. right? Mm-hmm. But the power of video, as we know from TV and from cable, is massive. Yeah, so it matches the shock and awe with the real personal touch with the video. It's, uh, and, and the other thing is, of course, like the things that work the best are the things that people haven't seen before. It used to be direct mail in general just killed it because you weren't getting that much direct mail. Then it was certified mail. Then it was Federal Express. And we're always looking for something that just kind of shut, just kind of shakes you out of your you know, day to day stupor. And you go, oh, oh wait a minute, I got to pay attention to this. <laughs> and people just don't really. I mean, have you ever gotten a video brochure? Once. Okay. Yeah. So it's not that often, right? No, no, not at all. <laughs> and so you do take the time and actually focus. And that's what we as as people who market. And I don't think of myself as a marketer. I think of myself as someone who is really good at doing what it takes to actually make the revenue. And that happens to be marketing. But I'm not someone who does it for other people. I do it for me. Um, have you received anything personally or has Lisa received anything that sticks out that has impressed you? Yeah, I think um, one of the, anytime there's an, a, a, a really interesting object in there, I mean, one of the things that, that you'll read in Persuasion or Presuasion, Cialdini's work, is that you, know, you give before you ask. So I got a, a clear tube about a year ago. Um, it had a label on it, but you could still see everything inside. And inside was a little bear. It was a really nice bear. Um, and then there was a letter wrapped around the bottom. Hmm. So when you get it, the question is, are you throwing the little bear? There? <laughs> are you going to take the little cute bear and just throw it in the trash? <laughs> well, of course you're not. You're going to open it up and take the bear out. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was very, very good. And then of course, what do I, when you have the bear, what do you have? You have something that I gave you. So now, oh boy, psychologically, there's a sense of obligation, even mm -hmm. if it's, it, it, it may sound like it doesn't work. The psychological aspect of persuasion, it's extraordinarily powerful because it's built into our psyche since we were little kids. If you get something, you say thank you. Mm -hmm. The first mailing, 20, you spent $2,500. What happened? Oh, it wasn't $2,500. It was oh. $2,500 per person. So I had my, myself and my partner. So it was actually $5,000 we had. And basically, we wanted to start a company that would bring kids to D.C. to learn about democracy and citizenship um, and leadership. And we were going to mail 
the, the um, principals of schools. And we decided to do it through direct mail. We got a list of principals. And I said, oh, I remember that package that I did up at the senatorial committee. And I did what we call stealing smart. I basically knocked the package off um, and made this beautiful shock and awe baronial package with gold foil and something that looked like calligraphy and so on and so forth. And we dumped it in the mail. And that was it, Jeremy. I mean, that's all the money we had. If it had failed, we would have just gone our separate ways. But it didn't. Let it ride. Wow. Yeah. And it worked. It worked big time. And the, the thing that's so incredible about that package is it has never stopped working. Wow. So that package has been mailed in one form or another for 30 years and believe it or not, has produced over $1 billion in revenue. And if I took the original package mailed in 1986 and I put it next to the package that's mailed today, you go, oh, that's pretty much the same package, right? So it goes to show you the power of an incredibly effective mail uh, or advertising campaign that can produce. It's amazing. And, and, and the most important message for everyone that's watching is don't ever expect this to happen to you. Because <laughs> usually, usually it's going to take uh, dozens of tries before you find that combination of words and images and lists and all the rest that actually gets people to open up their mm. wallets and give you money. Um, but we just lucked out. We completely lucked out and we built a a really big small business on that. Yeah. I don't know. Luck, luck has, is a factor for sure. But I mean, I'm sure you, what was some of the key messaging in there that, of why it works? Well, it was honor prestige. Yeah, 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 I always write the copy. It's, yeah. um, it's honor, prestige, and exclusivity. All the programs that we create are very selective. You have to have a certain GPA, you have to, or you have to be selected by your teacher or your principal or your counselor. Um, there's very limited space. Um, you have to respond by a certain date. So it really is all yeah. about um, um, letting people know that this is an honorific experience. It's mm -hmm. one that not everyone gets uh, uh, the chance to do. And, um, and that's great. But the most, I think the most important message is that this is like, this is marketing to do good in the world. Right. So this is not marketing to sell just whatever, you know, a dish rag. This is marketing to get young people and their parents to do something that's going to incredibly enhance and benefit them in their future. Mm -hmm. To get them to do that, you actually have to get their attention because if you don't sell anything, you yeah. can't change anyone's life. Yeah. So selling is not a dirty word. Selling is a beautiful word if it lets you affect a, a young life like we've been doing for so many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think saying it's luck sells your skills short. I mean, there's some luck involved, but you had all those elements in there, you know, prestige, exclusivity, you had a deadline, you had all the key elements, you know, and I did. so, yeah. But still, you, the, the truth is that mm -hmm. only the customer gets to vote and the thing you think is going to work isn't usually the thing that does work. Um, it's, and that's why you need to sort of sit, fail your way to success. You need to mm -hmm. try over and over and over and over again. And because of that, it's really hard to bootstrap marketing. You need to have some money to put into this thing so that you can try different things and fail until you find the thing that succeeds for you. Well, we just got lucky, my friends. What was the initial response from that mailing? It was phenomenal. I mean, I don't recall the exact... Um, Who are you sending rate. it to? Principals. Principals. We okay. asked them to return gotcha. a card expressing interest. And we just, I remember coming back from lunch one day and there was this huge stack of cards. And my business partner was just sitting there staring at this stack of business reply cards. And as soon as we saw that, we knew we were going to be uh, successful. Now, of course, as time went on, the package didn't work as well. We had to come up with different list sources. It went on and on. But if you want to change the world, if you want to impact people's lives, you got to keep working at it. So, Richard, who's been a fan favorite? So, to the like, I was I was saying, you know, um, TED Talk, Tony Robbins meets rock concert. Who's been a fan favorite of who has been featured on the stage? And if anyone hasn't seen it, look up Richard. There's an amazing picture of him standing. There's just a sea of students 
in the stadium uh, behind, you know, behind him. So. Oh yeah. Um, God, where to start? I mean, the whole idea, Jeremy, is to put people on that stage that are going to, that are going to blow the, the young people away and inspire and motivate them and show them such a much bigger future. Um, but there's a woman um, who's, and her name will come to me in just a second, um, who I think was by far the most inspirational. Mm. And um, she lived in New Hampshire. Um, she was divorced from her husband. And one night, um, her husband uh, broke into her house with a baseball bat and beat her to a pulp and then doused mm -hmm. her with industrial lye and literally melted all the skin off her body and mm -hmm. a lot of the bone. So she was in a um, induced coma for three, four months. Um, she's undergone um, over uh, 90 surgeries. She's had one of the first people in the world to have had a full face transplant. Mm. And, um, and on the stage, she says, you know, I have completely forgiven him. Mm. I've completely forgiven him. Of course, he, he was in prison. He died in prison. Um, and she explained that she didn't forgive him for him. She, just, she forgave him for her hmm. because she couldn't go on until she let go of anger. And she has described how she's remade a life for herself and has a boyfriend and has like a little band and um, the optimism she has. Um, and I, I, I remember standing uh, behind stage uh, and saying to her, you know, you piss me off because now I can't feel bad <laughs> about myself for anything. You know? right, I just, right. Because you're just so brave um, and so amazing. And she just brings the house down every time she, she goes on stage. And I, her, her name will come to me in one second. It's just yeah. flown out of my brain. It really and puts things mind in perspective. It's mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Wow. That really yeah. puts things in perspective. Like how do we, for something simple someone does in our daily lives, how can we, you know, not forgive them compared to what, what she's forgiven someone for? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thing is, kids have great like bullshit meters and they recognize immediately that she is the real deal. She is 100% genuine and they just love her for, for her. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great, great thing. And I always like learning from you, not just from the marketing side of things, but from the um, the parenting side of things. Um, I always love your perspective on this. So I'd love to hear some of the things that you have done and instilled in your kids. Um, and, you know, one of which is, you know, you have a separate, you have a separate date night, which has inspired me and, and my daughters. So I'd love for you to talk about the few of the things that you do or have done with their kids to just, um, you know, as far as raising children, which is, it just can be a daunting task. It is a daunting task. Quite no question about it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they, um, they say that uh, sleep deprivation is a form of torture under the Geneva Convention, and it is. And that's one of the first things you face as soon as you have a kid, right? <laughs> um, uh, but um, I think a, a couple of things. First and foremost, there's nothing that you can give a child that's more valuable than two parents that love each other hmm. and like each other. Uh, because if they don't, the kids will feel it. Hmm. No question about it. So Lisa, my wife, and I really invested in that. Luckily, we love each other and we like each other anyway. But it would have been so easy for us to go into what I call small business mode. Okay, we're running a small business. You're in charge of transportation. I'm in charge of finances. You know, you have to take care of discipline. Da 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 da. But instead, we said, okay, every from the moment that child is born, the first child. And I remember my wife Lisa saying, "Just remember, they're on our trip. We're not on their trip." Mm. And it was such a profound statement. Um, and every week we went out and we had uh, a date night in the beginning. It was just 30 minutes and anything could be talked about, about except one thing. And I guess you know what that is. The kids, they were off limits, right? And then we would start almost immediately taking 10 days every year to just go away together. Um, and everyone's like, oh my God, you're deserting your kids. Absolutely not. First of all, <laughs> the kids could care less. 
Why are right? other people guilting you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the kids could care less. And secondly, they came back, uh, we came back and always showed them parents who really love each other. And the funny thing is if you see, like I remember a time where I was kissing Lisa in the kitchen and I guess my dad, no, it was my son. He was about 10 years old and he comes and goes, oh my God, oh, you know. And, but then I looked at him and what is he doing? He's smiling. Why mm. is he smiling? Because now he knew he was sick, he was safe, he was secure, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Gave him this sense, and and that was everything, right? And the other thing that I, I guess the one thing that I learned more than anything else from my mom is, you can teach your children anything, anytime, for the most part, but if they lose self confidence, mm. it's a huge lifelong problem. So at all costs you need to defend and protect your children's self-confidence. Uh, and if that means pulling them out of a class or putting them into a class, it doesn't mean you don't challenge them. It doesn't mean you don't push them, right? It just means you do whatever it takes to create and maintain a strong sense of self-confidence, right? And independence. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that uh, will really do them um, incredibly well through life. And the last thing I'd say is, the most important things to know are never taught in school. It's those things that you and I have learned in our 20s or 30s or 40s about life success skills, negotiating skills, speaking skills, self-confidence, gratitude, um, listening skills. It goes on and on. The things that make us money, that allow us to influence, that make us feel good, all those things are not taught in school. So mm. it's up to us as parents to realize that we cannot subcontract our children's education to the government. It's not that they won't go to school, but it's our job to supplement all that with yeah. whatever it takes so that they grow up having those life success skills in place. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting some of those things. I love hearing about alternative ways um, to educate, inspire kids. And you spent a year traveling the world with their kids. And so talk about some of the things you did and why you did them and, and what yeah. they discovered. Well, I have to say that uh, of all the things I've done in my life, if I list the top two or three, that is on the list. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a big deal. Uh, we took eight months. We took the kids out of school for an entire school year. How old and were they we, at the time? Anna was uh, 12 and Anna okay. and Willie was 10. And when they, we ended the trip, Anna was 13 and mm. Will was 11. When you uh, presented it to them, what was their reaction initially? Well, Will was all for it, right? Mm. He was like, oh, great. I'll go pack my bag. <laughs> with, He's Anna, ready. Yeah. With, with Anna, we had a big problem, and that is that Anna is a, a very, very talented and nationally ranked equestrian horse rider. And has been since she, and has been devoted to the horses since she was literally two years old. So the idea of leaving her ponies for a year and not competing for a year was devastating to her. So we actually had to make a few um, modifications so that we could come back briefly uh, during that year and mm. she could compete. And, and I get it. I mean, talk yeah. about. I mean, if when your kid does have that self confidence and is passionate about something, you just can't rip them away from it for a year. So, but we made it work. So, what were some of the thing highlights of that of that journey for, like, as a parent child perspective? Well, first, let me say that it, it, the impact was enormous and exists to this day, and we still talk about it. Um, and to me, the most important thing was that they understood that basically everyone is the same. They all, uh, they all want uh, the same things in life, and they all want to protect and defend and make sure their children have a good life. And they may look different, they may sound different, they may smell different, but at the end of the day, we are all the same. And that message is one that they came back with. We really went to all seven continents, including Antarctica. Um, we uh, used a, we had a, a teacher that we had hired remotely and they actually had video conferences and mm. classes um, on a daily basis that used what they actually had experienced during that day um, as mm. the materials. We hired uh, people to, as guides who had experience with children 
which was great because I understood what they were saying then. And these guides can <laughs> be right. The guides can be so dense, but and, and with the materials that they deliver, but here it was just, Oh, okay. I get it. And then we, what we used was a, a method of learning called spiral learning. So we would go to Australia and we'd see what happened with the Aborigines. Then we went to Africa and we saw with, with those people and we say, okay, how do we compare? How do we contract? What does, what's the difference? What's the same? And we'd build that throughout the year. But we went to Antarctica, as I said, we went to the Galapagos Islands, we went to Machu Picchu, we went to Egypt, Greece, China, uh, we went to um, uh, just so many places. Um, it was amazing. Chile. And Australia, of course, and they saw and learned so hmm. much. It was incredible. What gave you the idea to do that? Jeremy, I'm the foggiest notion, but it was hmm. it in just, my head before the kids were even born. Really? I just, hmm. Yes. I just knew someday hmm. I want to. I want to take them around the world. And mm. I just feel so blessed that we had the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. I bet someone will watch this and be inspired to do the same that maybe and didn't, yeah. maybe didn't think about it. Well, if they, if you are, um, number one, feel free to get in touch. And I'd be happy yeah. to, to chat about my experience. And number two, and this is really, really important. If you have the opportunity and you're thinking about whether to do it or delay, do not delay. Mm -hmm. The reason is if you're healthy now, who knows what's going to happen a year from now? If you've got the money now, who knows what's going to happen yeah. a year from now? If you've got a chance to do it, yeah. go for it. Yeah. I mean, it can be been done on a micro level, even if someone goes for two months or, you know, you could do it however works in your budget or however works in, you know, you could do the U.S. and not go around the world. So there's a number of ways to do it. I think just the concept is cool just to experience the different cultures in different, different places. You know? Absolutely. And at the same time, it's an incredible way to connect with your children and, uh, and do so because what is better connection than when you have a shared experience over and over again? That's a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. thing. Let's talk about health because you mentioned do it while you're healthy. You know, mm -hmm, um, just mm -hmm. you never know. Um, you know, I hear scary things every single day of someone, you know, having health issues or even the other day a family member got hit by a car like you just you just don't know and so I want to talk about your inspiration of the da Vinci 50 5 um, and how did you become interested in this in the first place and well, when I say I this explain explain what this is right it's for people listening life extension longevity I don't know how you would describe it I would describe it as um, staying really healthy as long as is humanly possible, and if possible, um, making that length of time longer than um, than is typical. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and just to put that in perspective, I'll be sixty-five in January, so I received a mailing from the Social Security Administration. <laughs> You're looking good. Last month. Yeah. I, I think I am, yeah. but who the hell knows, right? I, and. Um, and in that mailing, it said, just to let you know, Mr. Rossi, in the United States, at your age, uh, on average, you will live till 82. Hmm. Whoa. That's it? Time's ticking. And, yeah. and by the way, 82 is average. That means I may live longer or I may not live that long. And this is based on millions and millions and millions of data points. This is not their opinion. And they said, the other thing we'd like you to know is the only one in 10 will live to 91. And I said, um, first of all, why the hell are you telling me this? Like, what, what is the, what, what good is They want to send you into a depression. No. Right. Did you feel like they just <laughs> had to throw that out there for what, I mean, literally when you read it, Jeremy, it's a non sequitur. They put it in there, then they go on to something else. It's like, there's no reason for them to say it. And yet they do. Um, but look, I was, um, I was there. I was right next to my mother's bed when she died. Um, and I was 24 you were years young. old. I was. I was very young, and that's when I death became real to me. And um, she had a brain tumor. She only lived nine months after it was diagnosed. Mm. Uh, there was no chance she was going to survive. That was out of the question. Um, Sorry to hear and that. Yeah. yeah, it was rough. Um, but it was kind of at that moment that I, I it really really hit me that there's a complete and utter hard stop. Right. And I looked in her eyes. And I was wondering, oh, now I'm going to see 
uh, that smile, like, oh, she's, you know, she's going to heaven. That, no, there's none of that. She just died, right? Mm. It wasn't painful, um, though many deaths are. Um, it was just she faded away. Uh, but it never, obviously, that was a shocking experience, and it stayed with me to this day uh, and has deeply affected me to this day. And uh, while many people go through their daily life not thinking about aging or disease or death, I do, <laughs> for better or worse. Mm -hmm. So you could have gone on this personal self journey, but you chose to do something a little bit different, right? So why did you decide to start this as a, a mastermind group? Well, let me roll the tape back a little bit. So when, when I got to be in my um, early 40s, uh, that's when I first remember thinking about, is there something you can do to affect this? And I brought this little book out. This is a book that I read when I was like in my early 40s. Mm -hmm. It was called Successful Aging by the MacArthur Foundation. Mm. I remember showing it to my dad, who was still alive at the time. And I was saying, you know, how to make lifestyle choices now more than heredity, and how that determines your health and vitality. Very interesting. But that was kind of when I started reading about these things. Now, I just want to make a statement straight up so all your people are watching and listening. This is, I am not very good at this. Um, I'm kind of afraid of the medical profession. I'm super lazy. Um, I'm not as healthy as I should be. I don't work out as much as I should. Do. I, uh, I don't always eat the right thing. Um, I know more that I should do than <laughs> I actually do. Yeah. Uh, and I am trying to be better about that every day. And the older I get, the more motivated I am. Um, but the thing I really realized is that we are programmed to degenerate, degrade, and die. And some say that starts when you're in your late 20s. Some say it's in your 30s Some say when you're 40s. in third grade, there's probably, I think thought there were studies on, they did like third graders and they had like placking on their arteries already. It can happen. Right. I mean, it's interesting The people like uh, some of the uh, people who do uh, electronic gaming, um, which is a huge, huge business. When you're 21 or 22, you're over the hill because your reaction time has gone down too much. Mm. The ones that are winning the big contests are 17, 16, 18 years old. Mm. But that's not really the point because uh, into your late 20s or 30s, um, you are vibrant and, and generally speaking, very healthy. But there obviously comes a point where nature wants the parts back. And <laughs> at, at that point, um, in many ways, large and small, uh, without you realizing it until there's a tipping point, you're degrading. I'm sorry to have to tell you guys this, and I know it's super depressing, but it's the truth. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we start getting into all the conditions of older people, cardiovascular disease, cognitive and neurological diseases like dementia, back and neck pain, osteoarthritis, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, cancer. It goes on and on and on. These are diseases of aging, right? And um, the question simply is, can we avoid those or can we delay those? And can we remain healthy and alive longer than is generally uh, uh, considered like what's going to happen by the Social Security Administration. Mm. And that's, that's been my, that's been the thing that I've really been focused on. And I have to tell you that up to just a very few years ago, the answer was, yeah, kind of not so much. So we could do the four things that we always should be doing, which is exercise, stress control, nutrition, and sleep. And that's going to keep us as healthy as possible for as long as possible. But it is not, not, not going to reverse or retard mm -hmm. the aging process. It simply means you're going to age uh, slower and, and healthier, okay, if you're lucky. But to actually retard the aging process, that requires a whole host of other things. And that's what we're focused on right now. Halting the aging process or reversing, not, 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 or not, reversing no, aging process. In, in my world, it's, it's about slowing it down and possibly, possibly 
uh, reversing it temporarily. There are people that have higher aspirations. I'm not one of them. Yeah. I'd be very yeah. happy with that. Uh, with that. Yeah. Um, because uh, let's face it. I mean, the, the most of the insurance dollars are spent in the last few years of life. We all think we're going to be the one that's, that's spry into our 90s and then drops dead in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, that's not actually the way it happens the vast majority of the time. It's a slow, sad decline. Um, and in fact, quick story, uh, you out there in Chicago had a mayor, Mayor Emanuel, right? Mm -hmm. And Mayor Rahm Emanuel, he had two brothers. He has two brothers. One uh, is the most powerful agent in Hollywood, Ari Emanuel. And the other is Ezekiel, uh, is a very renowned uh, surgeon and ethicist at the University of Pennsylvania who wrote in the Atlantic Magazine an article called Why I Want to Die at 75. Hmm. And in it, he basically said, nothing good happens after 75. He said, you might think it does, but I'm a surgeon, I'm a doctor, I've been doing this for 40 years, and let me tell you, it doesn't. Hmm. Um, so when you come to actually believe that and accept that, which I think is the truth, now you go, okay, what can we do about that? What can we do about that? Uh, do we just accept it with a little bit of grace, or do we actually try and take action and that led to the founding of the da vinci 50 yeah um so there's two things i want to talk about how you assembled this uh amazing group of faculty advisors and then um also um what you do um because you've you've learned a lot um over the years so um maybe start with a little bit with um how you like you probably chose each advisor and faculty for a specific reason, I imagine. Yeah, well, first let me just define the, the Da Vinci 50. So it's really a trial program, an experiment to answer the following question What would happen if we took a group of 50 incredibly successful, incredibly smart, and motivated individuals who all want to live as long as is possible? and as healthy as is possible, and we team them up with some of the biggest names in the world, the doctors, the scientists, the biohackers, who have actually achieved and are achieving the breakthroughs. What would happen if they were actually our mentors, our guides, our teachers, and we then had the opportunity not only to do what they told us to do, but then to support one another as a community? Mm. What could happen? And that is the Da Vinci 50, right? Each person has to be awesome. Each person has to be rowing in the same direction as we are. Each person has to be ready to try their best to live their best life. And interestingly, um, when we talk about the people who are um, our teachers, uh, let me just point to this cover of the... Uh, prestigious MIT Technology Review, Old Age is Over, and it talks about a number of those people mm. uh, because what's happening now is that the first anti-aging drugs are coming online, um, the first techniques that actually uh, could uh, retard the aging process uh, are coming online, but as with all things like this, they're not generally known about yet. They're not mm -hmm. FDA approved. No insurance companies are covering them. And believe it or not, they're even ethical issues. Oh, should we introduce this? Should people live longer? What will this mean to society? What will this mean to Social Security? Well, excuse me, I could care less about that. <laughs> I just care about me, my life. And um, I'm fascinated by the fact that these things are actually happening and I want access to those mm -hmm. people. And that's what this is all about. So yeah, I mean, when you look at the folks on, that are uh, on our, um, on, uh, that are our coaches, that are our grandmasters, obviously I'm looking at a list right here. We have Dave Asprey, who is the godfather, the father, some would say, of biohacking, um, an unbelievable guy. Greg Fahey, um, now Greg is a uh, professor out of UCLA who has actually created a three-drug cocktail that has demonstrably um, reversed biological aging in humans. Hmm. Now, I know that sounds incredible, but it's a peer-reviewed journal. Um, it's an FDA-approved trial, 
and he's done it. And I was watching the, the slides. I was watching all the blood work change. I was cha watching everybody's hair turn from gray to black. I was watching, I was looking at all these things that happened to muscle mass and all the rest. He's actually on the road to doing it. He may in fact have already done it. And then George Church, who you mentioned, uh, who's one of the one of the people who's actually put uh, CRISPR, the gene editing technology, into use. And if you were to interview him, he'd tell you within five years he's going to be able to edit out um, the diseases of aging and That's offer amazing. you a much much longer, much much healthier life. And George Church is a full Harvard professor. So these are the kind of people we're bringing to the table, the biggest names in the world who can give you actionable. Um, information mm -hmm. and um, and advice right this second because I don't want to as, as my friend Bo Eason said I don't want to put my life in the hands of amateurs I want to put my life in the hands of the best biggest best and brightest names in the world and that's what we endeavor to do with with Da Vinci 50. How did you Richard um, find out about Greg Fahey and his work? Well, I am one of these guys who just is really always reading. Um, and um, there's this, um, like, there's this Google service that delivers articles to you based on keywords. And I always have anti-aging in there and life extension and all these different words. And one day he popped up. And what was interesting is he popped up in Science Magazine, which is an incredibly um, well-regarded mainstream journal and in cell and biology, which is an incredibly well-regarded peer reviewed medical journal. Uh, so I knew he was a serious guy and I went out to a conference just so I could meet him. Um, and I was blown away by what he's achieved, but it, he's just one example. He's just one example. I mean, the truth is I believe that we're at a tipping point right now, right this minute, where if you know who to trust and you know what to do, you can actually extend your healthy lifespan uh, quite dramatically. And when you, before someone would think, oh, that's crazy, remember, we've done it before, over and over again. When the Declaration of Independence was signed, people were living to 36, right? Now we've extended life to an average of 78 globally and 83, according to the Social Security Administration. Um, so we've doubled it and we, did, we added 20 years in the last century. We're simply doing it again. The, the different, and it's just not something that's generally known yet. That's the bottom line. What are, so you mentioned successful aging. Are there any other books, uh, resources you should point people towards as far as yeah. books? Yeah. Well, Superhuman by Dave Asprey is a great one. Um, there's also, um, let's see, there's a fantastic book uh, by David Sinclair out of Harvard. Hmm. Um, I can't remember the title, but if you Google David Sinclair, David Sinclair. it's a brand yeah. new book. And he will be added to our faculty in the hmm. next couple of weeks, wow. I hope. If you're listening, David, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'm coming for you, my man, because it is just an amazing book. But it talks about exactly what what we're describing right now. Mm -hmm. right? Any other um, online sources or books that you'd recommend people? I, well, I, mean, I obviously ask personally. Like I love this stuff, and I've read you know read those into the blue, blue zones. You know all the different health related just to hear different mm -hmm. perspectives. Well, I, I, I want to be cautious because. Mm -hmm. um, there's, as there always has been, an enormous amount of information that's not going to actually do you any good out there. And that's one of the main reasons we have Da Vinci 50 is because there are 99 things that will do nothing or hurt you for everyone that's actually going to have an impact. And depending on your age, you don't have the time to make mistakes. Um, so we need to have people that we can trust. I will get some other resources that we can put in the show notes. Yeah. Um, but those two... That sticks um, out to you. Yeah, boy, those are both superb um, books. So, Richard, I mean, I want to hear, uh, hopefully everyone wants to hear, what do you do now, um, you know, in your everyday life, um, or have you done that you've experimented with, that you found, you know, has worked for you? Obviously, you can only speak from your own right. experience, so... Well, again, I want to emphasize that I'm I'm not the poster boy. I'm not the role model. I, well, that's I'm, why I want you to talk, right? Because okay, it's yeah. more of a reality. It's like you don't you're not waking up at like you know four in the morning, morning drinking yeah. green juice every day necessarily. But 
you also look at the, since you, you said I'm quote lazy, like I actually want to hear from a quote, you know, I don't think you're lazy, but a lazy person's version because they're going to find shortcuts. You know? Well, that, my friend, is what I'm always looking for is the shortcuts. So right. I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, and, and boy, there's so many, but here's some, here, here we go. Yeah. Um, so I, when it comes to exercise, I want maximum results in minimum time and minimum effort. So a couple of examples would be a machine called the Vasper machine, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's basically an aerobic piece of aerobic equipment. It adds... Um, pressure to the legs and the arms along with cooling and creates an effect um, within the body where 20 minutes of moderate exercise uh, is the equivalent of an hour, an hour and a half, two hours of mm. intense exercise. Mm -hmm. And they will give you a book full of the evidence and the sport teams that they've tested this on and so on and so forth. I'm convinced it's the real deal. A lot of our mutual friends have them. Um, and I use one every day that I'm in DC. Another great example is something called Katsu, which is K-A-A-T-S-U. And these are bands that uh, go around your arms and, and go around your legs, though not at the same time, and then inflate uh, using a, a piece of equipment that does this to a very scientific level. Long story short, it allows you to use very light weights, um, but the effect on your muscles is as if you were using very heavy weights. Um, so you could use a five or 10 pound weight, but your body thinks you're using a 40 or 50 pound weight. Uh, and, and it puts less uh, stress on the joints. It's got a lot of, that sounds, yeah, that's like a lot of positive right? effects. Yeah. No, no question. And bodybuilders have been using stuff like this for, decades but very crude and very dangerous versions of this this is safe it's extremely well thought through um and i i highly recommend that as well as far as straight drugs are concerned i think the one that is by far the most promising is called metformin um, and metformin is a drug that was uh, first developed 50 years ago for type 2 diabetics um, and um, it, um, it just it controls the blood glucose level, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it turns out it has some pretty amazing anti-aging properties, and it is the first uh, FDA-approved trial, which is going on now, hmm. for um, an anti-aging drug, the first time the FDA has ever acknowledged aging as possibly as a disease. Hmm. So... Um, uh, the, the people that are really into this have been using metformin for some for decades. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. But what it does in, ex in essence is it simulates um, calorie restriction. Um, and it shuts down something called the mTOR pathway. Uh, and because of that, all kinds of amazing things happen in terms of um, resistance to cancer and so on and so forth. And again, I want to emphasize, this is an old line drug, costs 20 bucks a month, has a tremendous success record uh, and safety record. So that's something that I would uh, put in is like, I would call like the first anti-aging drug. But mm -hmm. there are others that are coming behind it in the very, very near future. Um, the third thing I would talk about would be stem cells. So um, there are stem cells that can be taken from your own body, either your body fat or your bone, but there are also stem cells that can be taken from um, an umbilical cord on day zero, um, which have dramatic properties to them. And if you go overseas, or I shouldn't say overseas, out of this country to Mexico, to Colombia, to uh, Panama, you can go to very reputable places that actually have the ability to, uh, to multiply those stem cells. That's not legal in this country yet. Um, and as a result, you can get a, uh, an in injection or an IV with millions and millions of stem cells which go around the body, um, healing and reducing inflammation. And as we know, uh, chronic inflammation, big, big cause of aging and, and disease. So huge believer in, in, uh, in stem cells. In an ideal Again, world, 
Richard, money is no object. Um, what what do you think the experts recommend? How often should someone get stem cells and where should they get stem cells? Just just for health purposes, not saying, okay, like you have a back problem, they inject it in the back or a knee problem, they inject it in the knee. If you're pretty right. healthy, what is there a recommendation out there? Like yeah, you should get IV say- stem cells every six months or something? I don't know. The most aggressive that I've heard is every six months. Um, six every year is reasonable. Some people would say every two years. There isn't um, a ton of um, uh, track record on this. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I really want to emphasize to your listeners is, and there are going to be people who say, well, you know, this is all very interesting, but we're not going to know whether you actually lived longer until years down the road. So this could all just be hocus pocus. And what's really, really interesting is we've now developed a way, uh, which is mainstream science, you know, mainstream science, to actually measure your biological age Hmm. as opposed to your chronological age. It's called your epigenetic age. Hmm. Um, And that means that Jeremy, you know, could be 45 uh, chronologically, but could be 55 biologically or 35 biologically. And really, that's what matters. It's not your chronological age, your biological age. So if you're taking substances and you're you're in activities and you can then see that your biological Mm. age is going down, that's hard evidence that good things are happening in your body. Mm. Good things are happening in your body. Talk about, Richard, so tests. Tests people should do. And we talked about there's a calcium test, you know, that you can get, you know, uh, what are the tests you recommend uh, or that you've had? Right. Um, Cause I like, you know, obviously we can't recommend, but people can do their own research and do their own due diligence. But what have you done for yourself that um, I want you to recommend to me? <laughs> so. Well, I think one of the most important things is like bad news today is so much better than bad news tomorrow. Right. So what you want to get information, uh, at, at the earliest possible stage, if you have a problem, the very earliest possible stage. People talk about like pancreatic cancer being a death sentence. It actually isn't a death sentence. The reason it's a death sentence is because it's never discovered until stage four because there's no symptoms. But were you to discover it in stage one, you could be completely cured of pancreatic cancer, right? So um, a couple of things to that. First of all, I do a full body MRI um, every couple of years. Now, remember, MRI has no uh, radiation whatsoever, and to the best of our knowledge, it has no negative impacts on the body. I don't. Th- this is done without contrast, but it allows the, them to take a look at me, you know, ha- top of my head to the bottom of my toes, and say, "Is there any cancer in there? Are there any tumors in there? Is there anything going on in there?" Uh, and then they do a separate scan of my heart, uh, a separate MRI just of my heart, um, which is also very, very good. So uh, that's one of the, mm-hmm. the, my primary detection methods. Yeah. And, and the other is that calcium score. And I just want to explain what that is because President Trump just had one, business executives have it all the time, and yet you'll never hear a typical doctor talk about it or recommend it. It's basically a, a specialized kind of scan, like a CAT scan, that allows them to look at your arteries and tell well, how much plaque is there in there. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. And it gives you a score between zero and like 4,000. And zero means you have no heart disease. Up to 100 means you have um, a very tiny amount of heart disease, a tiny amount of lacking. And then it goes up and up and up to 1,000, which is oh my God time, at which point you would immediately want to go in and have like an angiogram and maybe have stents put in. The idea is to know this before you have the heart attack, right? So it's like, oh, he had 90 to, you know, he had 90, 90% blocked, and then he had a heart attack. That's what if we could people, find that, right? right? That's the, the first sign of heart attack is very often death. So the idea of being able to do this every few years and go, oh, you know what? I'm at zero. Well, Richard, you know, your, your cholesterol is a little high. We should give you a statin. No, no, you didn't hear me. It's at zero. I'm not taking a statin. Right. So it allows you to actually get a degree of insight, along with many, many, many super sophisticated blood tests, uh, liquid uh, cancer screening through blood tests, um, really amazing stuff that's going on out there. 
the other thing is like when we talk about healthy aging, so much of this is about uh, things like muscle balance, flexibility. You know, old people they fall down, they break their hip, um, they lose their balance, they lose their flexibility. It just happens, and and. If you can uh, keep your muscle, now as you know, uh, in your 50s and very much in your 60s and beyond, adding muscle is incredibly difficult. It's actually thought to be impossible, but it isn't. Um, there are pe- some things called peptides that you can um, inject subcutaneously, which are types of amino acids that actually can allow, uh, that can generate growth hormones uh, mm. and allow muscles to grow at any age. So it goes on and on and on. But guess what, my friends? You're never going to hear this from your neighborhood doctor because the truth is your neighborhood doctor, hear me on this, is thinking the way that Ezekiel Emmanuel is thinking, which is I'll do whatever I can for you at 70 or 75, but I'm not expecting you to really live much longer. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not giving you all my best time and best work because you're on your way to your grave. <laughs> that is the way that- It's a different paradigm. Doctor it's a totally, 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 totally different paradigm, but it's the paradigm. It's the way that people are going to be thinking five, 10 years from now, normally every day. But guess what? I don't have five years. I don't have 10 years. And what we think at the Da Vinci 50 is very simple, which is if the risk is low and the potential reward is high, then you should have a propensity to action. Take the tiny risk for the big reward. And the doctor will not even take that tiny risk because of liability. But you are the CEO of your own health, and you have to make those decisions and not subcontract it to your medical professional, who at the end of the day is nothing more than a consultant. Mm. So for like instance, for a calcium score type of thing, would you ask your doctor to administer it? I would ask them to write Mm. me a script because it can Mm. be done at any radiology center. Um, and most doctors will do it upon request. They may go, oh, you know, I don't know, you know, it's not FDA approved, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, hey, you know, just do me a solid and, and cut <laughs> me a script on this. The, I just want to know I have plaquing, I'm going to drop dead, just sign the script. Right, <laughs> right. But when you learn like, oh, the president gets it done and chief executives get it done, do you think they'd really do that if there was nothing to it? Right. So we know the president has a calcium score of 130 or 140 because his personal physician revealed that a few days ago. Hmm. Um, So he does have some early or some, I should call it mild heart disease. Um, There would be no way to know that for sure unless he had actually gotten the scan. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to emphasize to your, to your viewers and listeners, that this is not perfect science. You could have a, a, a score of zero and still have a heart attack because of other elements, but it tells you that things are good. Things are. It's good. just one measurement in in the whole graph, right? I mean, but it, it's better than zero measurements in the whole graph. Absolutely, and we could go on and on in terms of things that people don't pay attention to, like bettering their glucose control and their blood pressure. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the dietary things. You know, we've talked about your thoughts on intermittent fasting and other things. What do you, what have you seen? Oh, intermittent fasting is fantastic. I mean, it's the real deal. Um, There's tremendous science behind it going back many years. And just to describe what that means um, to your viewership, uh, this means that you only eat during a limited number of hours. So for example, you might say, well, I'm only going to eat between one and eight, or I'm only going to eat between 10 and seven, right? So that you have a long period of time where you're quote unquote fasting. Now you have people that are, that, that are much more intense about it. I have a friend that only eats in a four hour, I think, or a three hour uh, time span. And then you have folks like my wife who actually doesn't even get hungry until the mid afternoon. So it's no big deal at all for her to, um, be intermittent fasting for 16, 15 hours a day. Well, guess what? She's losing weight. And um, she's also helping in terms of um, all of all of her, the things that that helps. Yeah. Like, um, one of the biggest is inflammation. 
I mean, people get right. scared off by that term, intermittent fasting. It's very simple. It's just you're right. eating within a des- like you said, a seven or eight hour period. You're fasting, quote unquote, for a 16 hour period. Have you seen or heard um, what's optimal? Like you said, oh, my, there's a friend who does eats within a three or four hour period. Is that healthier or not as healthy? You know, that, that can put a strain yeah. on certain things too. I imagine like we had talked about, it could put a strain on the kidneys and other organs. So I don't know if you've seen like, okay, let's say I can choose any span, even if it's two hours, what would be the optimal? And I, right, it's going to be right. different. What would right. be the optimal? Um, t- I've never heard, really heard that many people talking about it. I hear more, okay, you just eat within an eight hour period, fast for 16, but I've always thought, well, what if I'm only eating for a four-hour period? Is that better? I don't know. Right. Well, um, and this would probably be a great time to reemphasize to the whole viewership, do not do any of this without seeking medical, um, with your own. Without joining without, the without Da Vinci going. 50. No, I'm just well, yeah, without, <laughs> without, no. without getting a medical professional to sign yeah. off on it, because there are people who shouldn't be doing this at all. And you just mentioned people with kidney disease. That would be a great example. But for folks that are in generally good health, one of the most important concerns is what can I actually do every day consistently? It's not what can I do, you know, like occasionally. But like what my wife discovered was, you know what, I can actually start eating at four and end at eight or nine. And I can do that and there's absolutely no... She has no problem with it. Yeah, and it's not interfering socially, right? And if it, and it's not, and listen folks, if you're out one day for brunch, go for it, right? It doesn't have to be every single day. As, as one of my doctors said, be religious, but don't be fanatical. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it's what you do 85% of the time that's going to make the difference, not what you do 100% yeah. of the time. Yeah. Uh, but I, to me, my way of thinking, like, uh, uh, you know, if you were to eat simply um, – like uh, one to eight or one to seven, you'd be, it would already be a really shape. good thing. Yeah. yeah. If you could make it maybe three to seven, that would be even better. But listen, if you just skip breakfast and start at lunch um, and then don't snack after dinner, you are already doing amazing things that most no one else is doing. And by the way, again, it's not theoretical. You'll be able to see the actual results on your blood work. Your C-reactive protein will go down. Your glucose will go down. All your numbers will start to improve. You'll see it with your own two eyes. Richard, I can do this for another three hours. I know you're busy. So I just want to thank you. Be the first one to thank you. And this has been tremendous, phenomenal. Um, I always always learn from you. Um, and where should we point people towards? We can tell them to check out the Da Vinci uh, 50, V and then D-A-V-I-N-C-I 50.com. Uh, where else? Is there anywhere else we should point people towards? No, I've got um, a little video there that talks about it. And then I also um, have um, a little webinar there where I go on for 30 minutes about things that you can do right now. But the fact is, I I guess the most important thing I want to leave everyone with is the times they are are changing. We are at the cusp right now of of a moment where I believe with all my heart um, and really, really brilliant people also believe that we can uh, and will be able to cure chronic diseases and extend vibrant life in our time, in our, in our lifetime, right? So the first rule is don't die. The second rule is to the best of your ability, don't get sick because it's even if you aren't in the Da Vinci 50, even if you aren't at the very front of the line, like we are, it's coming and it's coming really, really fast. Um, and you, you want to just be sure you're on red alert for all of this as it becomes available. Hmm. Thank you, Richard. Fantastic. It's a joy. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Totally. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.